Hey gearheads and welcome to GT Garage Talk, a discussion about all things automotive. I am your host Corey and on this week's episode, my wife pulled a prank on me. Uh, she is desperately wanting to torture me, I do believe, because she introduced me to this week's guest, a friend of hers through her line of work in the travel and tourism industry. Uh, his name is Joe Trevino. He drives a 2011 Chevy Camaro SS with a six-speed manual, and he just got back, recently participated in his fifth Big Bend Open Road Rally, which is something I desperately want to do now after talking with Joe and his experience. So without further ado, let's let's bring in Joe. All right. So uh, Holly was telling me a little bit about this uh, Big Bend Open Road Race. Um, yep. I'm sure we will dig deeply into it, but how, how are you doing? I'm awesome. Uh, well, I work for Certified Folder Display. We're a brochure distribution company. Oh, yeah, that's I've been right. doing this for about 27 years. And Holly is a client of one of our guys out of Dallas, Fort Worth. That's right. She had told me that. I, uh, and, it, it's uh, been a busy week. Just better over the years at conferences and stuff like that. We haven't done any business together, but um, started, ran across y'all's channel and. Uh, it's hilarious. Y'all are a younger version of me and my wife. We hear that uh, quite often, so we're glad uh, to wife, uh, help out. My wife care less about cars. Uh, we play the, hey, honey, what's that? She has no idea <laughs> and has no desire to, or care to uh, do it. But uh, I've been, you know, I grew up at my grandfather's paint and body shop mm. in South San Antonio, and that's kind of where my uh, love of cars comes from and, you know, working on them and, uh, mainly in the paint and body side, but, uh, just, you know, a few years ago, uh, when my son graduated from college, got a big raise. So I bought me a toy. Yeah. So what'd you buy? I have a 2011, uh, Camaro, uh, two SS. Nice. So, uh, and that, had no desire to do open road racing or anything like that. But, um, buddy of mine, Dan, uh, Decker, uh, I had known about the big Ben open road race for years mm -hmm. and always wanted to go out there and do it. And he was out there doing it. So I just drove out there to watch him. Yeah. And, and you know, and then the next year he says, why don't you do it? Cause he had the same car I had, right. except he had a hard top and I had a convertible. And I said, Okay. So uh, I did the least modification class I could do, which was basically hang a fire extinguisher in the car <laughs> and uh, did the 85 mile an hour class, which, is, as you know, in that Camaro is nothing. Right. And just had fun with it. Tried to learn a bunch from talking with a lot of these older guys that do this that are just really intriguing. Uh, you know, they've been doing this forever. Um, and just had a blast. And this was, this year was my fifth time participating in the race as a, a driver. Wow. And, uh, you know, we've pl I placed once, uh, last October in the 115 class, we got third place. Nice. Uh, it, so it's, it's just a lot of fun. You know, when you have cars, performance cars, this is a legal way that you can go out and, right. you know, stretch their legs, uh, in an area that is to me, it, you know, West Texas is just one of the coolest places, and there's just plenty of room right. to do these things. Well, uh, Joe, I, I thank you so much for joining me today, and I, I'm going to live vicariously through you through this conversation because I don't know if Holly shared with you, I don't know how much I've shared on uh, videos and things that you've watched thus far, but I had a 2012 uh, 45th anniversary SS coupe yep. and absolutely adored that vehicle for the one year that I owned it because, <laughs> uh, I bought it when I turned 25 and, uh, m may have 
made an emotional purchase because I've always loved Camaros and, you know, the magical thing that they say, right. uh, our, our insurance goes down when we turn 25. So, uh, I also got a raise at the time and it's a nice present to myself. Right. So absolutely nothing wrong with that. <laughs> Do it while you can. So uh, you're, you were young enough to recover from those. Decisions. Right, right, right. And yeah, as you say, 85 miles an hour is nothing in that vehicle because, uh, the, I, well, I don't have to knock on wood cause I don't have it anymore, but the one and only speeding ticket I got in that car was coming home from my parents on Christmas Eve night. Uh, uh, may have been going faster than the posted speed limit, but just because it was so effortless in that car and I wasn't even paying attention, which was the problem, uh, to right. which uh, the state trooper who had to work Christmas Eve evening had to uh, make sure the roads were safe for all the the rest of the people out there from, you know, my hazardous driving of yeah. an undisclosed <laughs> speed. <laughs> So, We've all been there. <laughs> yes, yes, unfortunately. Um, you know, and to your point, this Big Bend open race, uh, open road race that you took part of is a great legal way to take part in that and stretch your car's legs out and find out, you know, exactly what it's about. So uh, you say you've participated as a driver five times and been six. Yeah. yeah. I've been to the race six times, once as a spectator and then the last five events they have. This is the 25th anniversary of the race, wow, okay. but they've actually done the race 24 times because in 2020 they didn't have a race. The year that shall not be named. Yeah, exactly. And then in 2021, uh, it was a once a year deal. They only did it in the third weekend in April. Mm -hmm. And then in starting in 2021, they're doing one in April and they're doing another one in October. Ooh, happy birthday to and, me. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, hey, if you want to come out in October and do a show from out there, uh, I, Crystal uh, Lopez, is, who is the race or coordinator, okay. I'm sure she would love to ho host you guys out there. Actually, I called her today and went, hey, how, you know, because the biggest thing about this race is there's a, there's a lot of old guys. Right. And in order for this thing to per perpetuate itself, it's got to reach out to a younger audience. Right, right. I am not that younger audience. <laughs> uh, but, you know, over the last two or three years, I've really uh, kind of got connected with the YouTube world and right. what goes on with the car, the car culture in YouTube. And I just think it's great. It's kind of how I got started, you know, people tinkering with a father or a grandfather or whatever. And then they just have this love of, of whatever, or you, or you see a car that you just fall in love with as a young man or a young child. And that just cap captures your attention. Right. Right. And, uh, it's just a great way to kind of spread your legs and, and just stretch them out. And out there you can do that. Uh, it's just so much fun. The communities just embrace this event. Uh, it's, it's just really nuts. Uh, you can't, you can't go anywhere without seeing everybody in race t-shirts and it's kind of cool. Yeah. So I, I've been out West Texas. Uh, Holly and I just got back from a Texas to California round trip road trip and it's a different country out there from my home base here in East Texas. Uh, oh. what, what can you tell me about, the scenery, the, the spectacle of the event? Well, the, the, the coolest thing about it is, is, is for me, I live in New Braunfels, Texas, and uh, I think it's an absolute shame. Anybody that drives out there, then they don't go out Highway 90. Okay. And if you've never been out Highway 90 from Del Rio to, to Marathon, uh, Sanderson, whatever, you miss one of the greatest spectacles in Texas, which is, is the uh, high bridge over the Pecos River okay. that is just absolutely spectacular. Uh, to me, that's the best way to go. Now, coming home, we come back on I-10 because it's the quickest. Right, right. Uh, because there's, you know, it's five hours from my house out there because um, a couple of years ago when I moved up in speed class, 
I put a roll bar in my car and the way it sits in there, it's not comfortable for a five hour road trip anymore. Right. Um, but, uh, that's probably the biggest thing is just the openness of it all. Uh, and, and just of the, you know, when you're driving down 90, all of a sudden your phone goes, welcome to Mexico. <laughs> And you're going, huh? Yeah, I'm mean, headed and leave. And you're going, well, your cell phone thinks you did. Yeah, you're there's, connected to the towers. There's just, there's just so many miles and miles of everything out there. Uh, it is. It's it's another world. Uh, you know, the adage, you know, Texas, it's a whole nother country. The l- tagline that the state has used for years and years. It's very true. Um, in my work uh, as a brochure distributor, my territory is north of Austin, to Temple, all the way to the Rio Grande Valley, halfway to Houston, and and all the way out to Big Ben if I want. Uh, I cover a lot of miles. Yes, uh, you do. You know, I've driven everywhere. Uh, as a young man, my dad was a traveling garment salesman. And when we all turned 15, you spent your summer with dad in his van. Travel, his, his territory was West Texas and Oklahoma. You know, you spent the three months of the summer driving for dad. Right. Uh, and so that's kind of where my love of a, there's nothing better than a good road trip in my book. Um, you know, if you got time, uh, even if you don't have time, you can. Uh, and then for about uh, 15, 16 years, I had a son who raced BMX bicycles. Nice. And we had an eight hour rule. If you couldn't <laughs> drive it one direction in eight hours, then we flew. Well, an eight hour rule in Texas doesn't mean anything. You're barely getting out of the state when right. you live in San Antonio. Right, right. Yeah, it, it's ridiculous. Uh, so, going back to that California road trip we took, uh, it actually took us two days to get out of Texas. I drove all of it and then we swapped to El Paso, and Holly was able to get three states in before we bedded down that night. She got the last yeah. part of Texas, uh, New Mexico, and uh, camped out in Arizona for that evening. And it was, it's ridiculous how big the state is. And yeah, like you said, you know, just getting an open road in front of you and a fun car, which it sounds like you have in your 2011 Camaro. So uh, I have to ask, uh, it sounds like you had the Camaro before the road race. Uh, Is there, I know you've done a little bit of modification. You said uh, the a roll cage in it and whatnot. Any thoughts of either modifying further or trading up? Yeah, but I <laughs> trading up is going to take an act of God. Uh, but uh, I have modified it. I've got headers on it. We nice. put on a cold air intake. Uh, we put on a 160 thermostat. Um, I've updated the brakes to slotted and drilled rotors. Nice. Um, I have. Um, foos wheels on it, chrome foos wheels on it. Um, you know that's, and I've had it, I've had it tuned. We're we're in about four thirty one, okay, uh, which is pretty good. I have some designs to maybe cam and you know maybe do a supercharger or something like that. But I am of the school is the more power you add, the less reliable they come. Yeah, and. For me, it's a daily driver. Not, it's not a daily driver, but it's a weekend driver. Uh, you know, when the weather's nice, where we live in New Braunfels, getting out to the hill country, there's there's not a better there's not better therapy uh, than that. Um, I owned a motorcycle. I've owned motorcycles most of my life. It's the next best thing without having to put on all that gear. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah, you really make a good point. It, they have to be livable, like. Yeah, you can make some sacrifices for comfort and stuff like that. But uh, if if it's not livable and it just becomes a, a track car that you've got to take there on a trailer, that kind of takes away some of the fun, right? Absolutely. Well, uh, I like I said, I, I'm going to live vicariously through you. You've participated five years. What was that first year like? I'm sure you kind of held back a little. I did because I had no earthly. I'm I'm a road trip guy, like I said, but I had no idea what I was getting myself into. I knew the car could do everything that it wanted. Uh, I did it solo because before I wanted to put another body in the car with me, (laughs) I wanted to make sure I knew what I was doing. 
Right. Uh, and the greatest thing about that first year, they only take 160 cars. Okay. The, the, the first challenge to the Big Ben Open Road Race is getting registered. Uh, it opens the first Monday after the new year at five o'clock. They open registration and everybody's hitting send. And literally, they don't tell you. Uh, it's January, February, about the first of March. They'll publish the race list, and that's when you found out if you sent it in in time. And now it's all electronic. Okay. Used to be you had to fax it in. Oh boy! Uh, the first time I did it, but now it's all electronic. Um, and so just getting into the race was a thrill in itself, uh, that first time. And then, you know, I was car number 160, which meant I was the last car to start. <laughs> it starts from the fastest cars, which are the unlimited cars, uh, to the slowest. And back then the slowest class was the 85 mile an hour class. Uh, this last year they eliminated everything below a hundred miles an hour. Okay. Uh, cause a lot of people weren't entering those classes. They were doing the 100, 110, 120 mile an hour class. And the 120, 100 and actually it's the 110 is the fastest class that rookies can enter. Uh, the first timers right. uh, can enter. And their max speed they can do is 124 is your tech speed. Uh, so those classes are big because all it's a lot of the first timers in there. And the math is easy at 100, 105, 103. Right. As, as we, lo- we have learned over the five years of doing this, and, and my navigator now is Dr. Jim Petrick from Texas A&M University, who is a, an esteemed uh, tourism research who's really good at math. Yeah. <laughs> it's always so, good to have uh, a good co-pilot. Yeah, he's my, he's my navigator and co-pilot now. Uh, but that first year I did it, the greatest, coolest thing was as being car 160, I got to watch everybody else start. Right. Because uh, uh, the way they do the staging, the last car, and then there's a row all the way down, half there. And then as everybody moves up, you just fill in behind. So I was right on the starting line all day and got to watch everybody go. Got to see a lot of the mistakes that people, but when you're doing a, it's a 59 mile leg each direction. Okay. Uh, so it's 118 miles total. So you see, when I say you see a lot of people make mistakes, you're not going to win the race at the starting line, but you can lose it. Right. Because you, you get out too fast, watch guys snap axles, drive trains, and all of that because they're in, ex- you know, you get really, really excited. Right. You've been waiting since, you know, the, uh, they get us on the grid at 5 a.m. Uh, they close the course at 6, and it's Highway 285 from Fort Stockton to Sanderson, and they close that 59-mile stretch at 6 a.m., and then they start sweeping that 59 miles. Truckers that have pulled over for the night, you know, you know, uh, roadkill that may be out on the road overnight and stuff, getting all that cleaned up and getting it ready for an 8 o'clock start. Uh, and so inevitably there'll be something one year, uh, we're at the finish line and we see the sheriff's deputy, probably a half mile, three quarters of a mile down the road. There was a herd of, uh, wild hogs and they had to shoot one of them. <laughs> <laughs> Got <leave>. left Texas. <laughs> <laughs> and we're going, and they, you know, have to drag it off to the side of the road and, you know, and stuff like that. Uh, but, um, you know, so that first year, that was probably the, 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 the greatest experience of it all was just watching everybody else start and just learning by watching. Uh, and, and that was very, very cool. And, you know, I had my radio going and I was honking at everybody on the return trip because I was the last car. Everybody was going to get to go home now. Right. Uh, so I just had a lot of fun with it and stuff like that, uh, which which is and still today, even doing uh, a little bit faster in the one I do the 115 class. Part of it is because I have a convertible, even though I did the roll bar. I'm kind of comfortable in that world. Uh, you know, a couple of years later, or the the year I went to watch my buddy Dan do it, uh, it rained early in the morning, and so they didn't send off the unlimited cars. The unlimited cars are purpose built race cars that. 
they'll average they'll average 170 My over the 118 goodness. miles. And to kind of put it in perspective, there's anywhere from six to eight unlimited cars, and they go off in three minute intervals. And by the time the first one starts. By the time the last car starts at three minute intervals, if there's seven or eight cars, the first car is done by yeah. the time the last car starts. Twenty they do about twenty one minutes, twenty to twenty one minutes on the on the course. Uh so those guys are moving. Yeah. And that year it drizzled, was a little damp that morning. So they didn't let the unlimited cars off first. They sent off another uh class first and about Two or three miles out of Sanderson, uh, a Porsche, I think it was a 911, a father's son team, uh, their car left the roadway and took out a telephone pole. And um, we had to wait all day. Uh, for They were fine. They didn't get hurt. Uh, the car was pretty much totaled, but, you know, that's what it was. And um, But they had to wait all day to get a telephone pole from Pecos, Texas, which is another 50 miles north of of Fort Stockton, all the way 50 miles south to Sanderson. So they could, because it took out all the electricity in Sanderson. Oh my goodness. And so uh, they only got to race one way that year because uh, they, they have to reopen that road by five o'clock. Right. And if they can't get the road open, uh, text dot, you know, that's their rule. And a couple of years later, um, when I was, I was doing the race, I was in 150 class. Ours was the last class that got to make the return run because it got late, uh, and they weren't going to be able to get everybody back. But, um, you, you know, so the waiting is probably the toughest part of it all. Yeah. Uh, as I learned a couple of years later, uh, we waited all morning, you know, this was in 2021, the year after the pandemic. And, you know, we'd all been pent up for too long, and I right. get on the starting line. A buddy of mine, uh, a mechanic, is navigating for for me that year, and I just get hyped up, and I take off, and I have a speed limit. My tech speed is 140 miles an hour, and they clocked me at 144, and I got disqualified at the halfway point. <laughs> Yeah, that would be the tough part. Like you said, 2021, everybody's amped up and ready to go. I know just from doing the uh, foot races that I've done, keeping your emotions in check are, is one of the most important parts of racing of any sort. Because like you said, snapped axles and just uh, and not treating the car with care uh, right. and giving it its due respect. So I'm looking a little bit at the course right now. You said it's 285 from Fort Stockton to Sanderson, Texas. Uh, are, are you just on 285 the entire time? The entire time. There's only three roads that cross onto 285. And along the course, there are course workers that at, at, our, at man gates that they close or chain any access onto that road. And at the three highways that access that road, uh, they have sheriff's deputies. Uh, the first two thirds of the course is there's a lot of straightaway. Yeah. Uh, you make up, you, you, you do a lot of, uh, you'll bank a lot of time on the first half of the course going south because the last third of course is where it gets really, uh, technical. Uh, there's some rock cutouts and there's, you know, the, uh, you know, text dot suggested speed at this curve is, you know, 35 miles <laughs> right, an hour. I right. think we were doing a hundred, uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, but cause that's when your speed starts coming down. And then the last about three to five miles into the finish line into Sanderson kind of opens up again. And that's where you kind of make, get, make sure you hit your time. And the funny thing is what they, they tell us is in the driver's meeting is, that most people make the biggest mistake is at the finish line because they're either trying to bank time or whatever. And you can't go slower than 30 miles an hour than your target speed. So if you go slower than, if I go 85 or less, right. you get disqualified on a straightaway uh, because it's, it, you have other cars that are coming And You know, that's the other thing. 
you can get past. And that's kind of when things really mess with your head <laughs> because the time uh, last year uh, in October when we placed third, um, a, tw- a 2021 C8 Corvette was behind us. We ran fast going south. He ran slow going south. So coming back north, we had to be slow. He had to be fast. With about five miles to go from the finish line, he passes us. And Dan was navigating for me coming back. And he tells me, you got to pass this guy again. And I'm going, "Uh, okay. And so I step on it. And I'm pulling up right behind him. Well, then here's the finish line is right there Mm -hmm. at 125 miles an hour. The last five miles drops pretty quick. And so we don't pass him. Uh, he ends up getting first place with a 0.17. Second place is 0.18. And we're third place with 0.19 off a of perfect time. Wow. I'm already dreaming up. <laughs> like, uh, I've sampled some really fun cars here lately, and some of which have not even gone up on my YouTube channel. Uh, I just got back from a track event at Texas Motor Speedway, and vehicles nowadays are so well built and so well put together that for $30,000, you can walk off a showroom floor with a Toyota GR86 and have a very fun car comfortable daily driver that sounds like it would do very well in the the lower class on this one because it is you know yeah. a little four-cylinder engine but you've got me scheming joe <laughs> i'm on more the merrier uh it's a great it's a great four-day week i mean it typically starts on wednesday uh down in sanderson wednesday and thursdays are in sanderson Uh, They have a driver's meeting for new rookie drivers to kind of explain and make sure everybody is on the same page. Uh, The safety requirements, you're going to get a lot of people think that it's over the top, but, you know, it's it's it is for your safety, you know, rated tires for the speeds that you're doing because, you know, they can't be more than four years old. Um, I replace mine every three years. I've never worn out my tires. Uh, they've aged out. Uh, they'll age out before they wear out. Uh, I owned an RV, and I never wore out a set of tires on that RV, but replaced a lot of tires over the 15 years I owned that thing because they just dry out. And, the, and to me, that's one of the most important safety things is because the last thing you want as a, at 125, you know, I maxed out. My top speed was 138 that I had. Uh, last thing you want is having some kind of tire problem. Uh, you know, uh, it was really, it was cool when we started, but by the time you got to the starting line, it had gotten warm and, and figuring out the airing down for the heat Mm -hmm. is, is a little bit of a challenge in itself because I had it happen at a, a, you know, at 130 miles an hour, your TPMS sensors go in now we're not working anymore. (laughs) At about 140 degrees, they kind of, about 40 uh, psi, they start going, eh, eh. yeah. Uh, and then you're really back to old school. I, I'm an old school guy, right? You know, what does the car feel like? Did the did the anything change? And you you go with that uh, because uh, you know sometimes too much tech, you know, you know you you forget what it's like to have that feel of the car. Somebody used the example to me the other day and goes, yeah, kid, you know, I have a son, he's 30 years old and he's into F1 and he has a SIM and all this stuff. He does all of that stuff, but he doesn't know what it's really like at 130 miles an hour, what a car is going to feel like. Right. Uh, And there's no reset button. (laughs) Yeah. uh, That's funny that you bring that up because uh, Last week's episode, I was interviewing uh, my photographer, videographer, who actually went with me to that track event at Texas Motor Speedway. And that was like, uh, especially my first lap out, I had to reframe and remind myself, okay, you're in an actual vehicle. You're actually doing the speeds that you see in front of you. There is no reset button. Please keep the shiny side up and the four tires on the track. Because... Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. I, I truly appreciate not only your sentiment about tires, because they are the only contact point between you and the road, but the fact that you upgraded your brakes. I, I think so many times we get so interested in horsepower numbers and torque numbers and acceleration that we forget, especially doing events like this, how important stopping power is and how much faster you can go when you've got a good set of brakes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's everything, and luckily, you know, it's at the finish line. Is you know, we have a the the, the rundown area where you slow down. It's it looks like it's a long way because out there there's nothing but distance. But <laughs> yes. it's amazing how fast when you know. I think when I crossed the finish line this year, I was doing one twenty mm. uh, or one twelve, and then you know, you know, half a mile down the road, I got to be down to thirty miles an hour, right? Because once we leave that closed race course uh we're on county roads and <laughs> the cops are everywhere yeah for our safety but they tell us yeah once you're off my race course the race director uh, he says you're fair game so right. you know you here's the rules and you got to follow them uh and stuff so it's it's uh it's a lot of the braking everything you got to think of everything um w- when you're doing these things what was it like the first year you had those upgraded brakes, were were you taking some higher speeds? Were you taking some more chances? I did. You you know, when, when, even when I was doing the 85, first year I did the 85, the the next, next year I did the upgrades and everything to the car and the brakes. And, you know, so you're pushing 125, 130 most of the way. Uh, And when you get into that technical section, you know, you're either accelerating or you're braking. There's yeah. no in between. If you're in between, that's when you're going to have trouble. Uh, so it helped. It made it made the car feel more stable uh, when I did have to brake. Um, and and you know, it's been a really good upgrade for us uh, and for what we do. Well, Joe, I, I, I'm going to pivot a little bit because okay. we're still going to relate this back to your experience at the Big Ben Open Road Race. I, I will get in touch with the uh, race organizers because, like I said, I'm scheming here. But every time I have someone on the podcast, I have a fun set of random questions that I like to ask. And having spoken with you so far about this, I've got a good selection here uh, that I'd like to choose from and just kind of get your insight from your experience and uh, see kind of where you go from here. Yeah, I've been, I, I, I did a little research, too, yeah. and uh, I listened to y'all's, a few of y'all's podcasts and uh, follow y'all's YouTube channel and stuff. And uh, like I said, I've kind of become a junkie to YouTube wow. over here the last two or three years because, you know, I think you there's a lot you can learn. Right. And, uh, and, I, and I enjoy the content more than anything else. And... and th- there's so much out there, but we, we thank you for uh, joining the Gearhead family here at GT Garage Talk. So the first question I, I ask of everyone, and it is no exception for you, do you name your vehicles? Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I have uh, my personal car collection uh, is I have, uh, of course, the Camaro. Right. Uh, I have a 25 HD, uh, 2010, 25 HD, uh, Chevy Duramax. Okay. And then my wife, we just got her one of the 2022 Blazers. Okay. Uh, and they're all black. I'm seeing a theme. (laughs) I swore after I bought the black Camaro that I'd never buy another black car and look what I have. And then, uh, my work vehicle, current work vehicle is a 2022 Bronco Sport. Oh, okay. Yeah, which I'm I'm digging a lot. Yeah. Uh, I've driven uh, minivans for 25 years mm. for work. Uh, Dodge Caravans, Astro Vans, primarily. They're, they're the best, most versatile vehicle. So, like, I, I and, get it. And so the EPA tells Dodge, you can't make those anymore. Yeah. Well, because it's because they were making all those Hellcats. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, so naming cars, I love cars, but uh, they're tools. Yeah. Well, one second. Okay. Right. 
Well, Mike Camaro had a name from before I ever even, before it was ever even produced, uh, because, you know, falling in love with cars at nine years old, uh, Cameron was her name and with, for obvious reasons, you know, nine year old sticking in on the end of Camaro and there you go. Uh, And because of that nine year old mentality, I've carried it through with all my vehicles since, but interesting that, um, the first non bow tie that you listed is the new Bronco Sport. Very, very interesting going with the blue oval there. Well, I had no choice. Okay. <laughs> My company sent it to me, and I was going, hey, it's not a minivan. Right. I, I moved up a little bit on the cool scale. Yeah. <laughs> Even your wife commented, she goes, hey, you're hiring? And I'm going, eh. <laughs> she has been wanting me to get a. Bronco Sport specifically, since she first saw them, it it is essentially the competition for her current car, which is a Jeep right. Cherokee. And, you know, Ford has sent me eight vehicles, and that hasn't been one of them yet. So I'm going to have to rectify that fairly soon. The only problem will be I won't get to drive it. She will always have it. Yeah. My only problem, and, and I guess it's with all the new cars these days, is even when we were shopping for my wife's car, we went and looked at some Chevys. You know, the Malibu, the biggest engine in it is a four-cylinder turbo. Mm-hmm. You know, the the Bronco Sport, biggest engines available is a, you get a two-liter, which is a four-cylinder, but right. heck, this Sport's a 1.5. It's a three-cylinder turbo. Mm-hmm. And for a guy who has a high-performance V8, <laughs> it, it, was, it was tough. You know, so my wife's blazer is at least the V6, right? Right. Which is a great car, and uh, we're going to take it on a little road trip to Tucson next week. Oh, okay. And see how it does out there. Yeah, I've always been a always. I haven't been around that long, but I've been a fan of that blazer platform in every regard except for the name. I think the styling is fun. They stand out. You, on the road, they look like a baby Camaro, and yep. uh, if they had just named it, you know, something else, I, I don't think there would be any blowback on them. But yeah, for some reason, yeah, because it's never it's never going to be an off road vehicle. No, 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 no. Never, never. I mean, it's a it's a performance S. You know, the V six version. It's a performance road car, right? Uh, uh, SUV. Right. You know, for the lack of anything else. Uh, but it's never going to be an off-road vehicle. Yeah. And uh, at least the Bronco Sport has a chance. Right. Well, yeah. now Chevy's teasing the Blazer EVSS. So the first electric Blazer is definitely going to be a performance vehicle of sorts because you slap SS on it. That means something to us bowtie guys, right? No, absolutely. Uh, you know, I watched your... Uh, I watched your Mustang Mach-E road, road trip. trip to Amarillo. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. As much as we want electrical vehicles to be yeah. there, they're not. Yeah. yeah. I, I was a glutton for punishment on that one. I am currently driving the 2022 EV World Car of the Year, the Hyundai Ioniq. And uh, I am planning, as we're sitting here to record tomorrow heading down to Houston and back. We'll see if that actually happens because uh, on a full charge, it can make it to Houston and be empty. Uh, There's plenty of charging opportunities at a higher rate of speed down in Houston. Uh, It's the getting back that's a problem because um, here in Tyler, Texas, we don't have any DC fast chargers, which this car can go from 10 to 80% in 18 minutes on a fast wow. charger. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, that's, that's about fueling up at a gas station. Exactly. And I, which is why I'm, I'm still kicking around the idea of actually road tripping it to Houston. So, uh, listeners, uh, stay tuned. Hopefully I, uh, pull the trigger on this crazy idea of mine to, Drive an EV to Houston. Well, uh, it was interesting. This year during the race, there were two Teslas. You know, I, I, I was going to dive into that a little bit as to whether or not there were any EVs. I, I think there will be more a, as we lean into it because um, the Ionic that I'm in is not necessarily the performance version of that platform, 
but the Kia EV6, which is essentially the same car with a different body, has a little more athleticism to it. So I can see as there are more on the market, it definitely finding its way into events like this. Yeah, the guy, the guy, one of the guys who was in the race, he was the last car off, and he didn't put it in a performance mode much mm. uh, because he was concerned about being able to make the 118 mile round trip mm-hmm. because there is no charging in Sanderson. <laughs> yep. Uh, bring a trailer just for backup on that one. <laughs> yeah, when yeah, I plugged. I when I plugged the Ionic in after driving it here from Dallas, it was like 53 hours. I was like, all right, well, this is going to be a little bit. And that was just at a no- normal 110 outlet, I right. assume. Right, right. Yeah. Just plugging it into my garage. All right. Yeah. Question two. You've already touched on it, but oh, as a holistic approach to vehicles, are you team more tech or less tech? I think that's a loaded question. It depends on what you're doing in the car. Right. Uh, my Bronco Sport that I drive for work right now has got all the tech uh, that you can imagine. It's the it's a big Ben edition. Okay. Uh, has the adaptive cruise control. You know, you put your hand on the steering wheel, it's going to drive for you. Mm-hmm. Uh, I find that very weird, but uh, <laughs> can't get but, you know, to my, my Camaro it. is. My Camaro is more, you know, it's a 2010. There wasn't too much tech in it. Mm-hmm. I like that better. Right. Uh, I like the feel of a car. I remember my grandfather being able to listen to a car and tell you, oh, this is wrong. We need to fix this. <laughs> you know, whereas nowadays, you can't find a mechanic that can do that anymore. Oh, I, where, where do you plug in the computer and I can tell you what's wrong with the car? Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Yep. You know, but nowadays it takes you longer to get a car repaired than it ever has, you yep. know. Uh, but so I'm a I'm a less tech guy in a in, in a in a big unless overall. It, unless it's your daily, then, you know, load it up. Right. Right. Load it up for the daily that I got it. You know, that I put 40, 50,000 miles on a year because uh, I and that's what I do. <laughs> yep. Let's see here. Uh, you also alluded to this one. Do you prefer two wheels or four wheels? Uh, now it's four wheels at, at this age. Yeah. <laughs> I rode two wheels for many, many years, but, uh, four wheels is better now. Yeah. Just kind of, you know, you, you, like you said earlier, you don't have to suit up and all the equipment. You just hop in and go and enjoy yourself. Yep. Right. I can wear flip flops and shorts and uh, <laughs> have a good time and, not worry about it. I was, uh, when I sold my motorcycle a couple of years ago or about a year and a half ago, I was 58 years old. I'm a 58 year old man who had to be home before dark. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cause that was my wife's rule. Uh, you're home before dark. And if you ever, if you break that rule, I thought I'd be happy. Yeah. Well, you know, like you said about the race safety first, right? Yeah, exactly. Manual or automatic? Manual all the way. Yeah. When did you learn? Uh, Straight off the when end. I, when did I learn to drive a manual? Yep. Uh, when I was about eight years old, yeah. my grandfather ran a patent body shop. And by the time I was 10, I was the primary uh, porter okay. at the shop. Nice. Moved and drove, got to drive everything uh, from buses to what are now iconic muscle cars that I didn't know about mm-hmm. back, back then. Uh, so... Yeah, all manual all the time in my book. True story. We took the Camaro to Talladega. One of my clients runs the double decker bus tours here in San Antonio. He's from England. He loves to suck up Americana experiences. <laughs> so I took him to Talladega. Yeah. We take the Camaro and we coming home, we pull into Mobile, Alabama at some hotel in the valet it's midnight and I First, made sure you are the valet. And he goes, yeah. And I goes, you know how to drive a standard? And he goes, yeah. Well, we go to bed. We come out in the morning, have breakfast. I come out. My car is in the exact same spot. <laughs> so it's a great anti-theft device. Yes, yes. Uh, the, the joke going around is that it's the millennial theft device. 
but I would say it's more or less the Gen Z, because uh, here as a millennial, I learned at, I would say at the latest, it was the age of 14, because my brother had a 1987 Mazda B2200 uh, yeah. with a five-speed in it, and that was what I got to learn in. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think it's a it's a necessary skill uh, that you should learn as a young driver, uh, because granted they're not as common as they used to be, but I think it's still a good skill set to have. Yeah, I've been told I've got a press vehicle coming with a six speed manual. Which, if that is the case, uh, my daily driver is a Chevy Cruze with a six speed manual. I'm going to take Holly around, teach her in the cruise so that she can drive the press vehicle while it's here. Because uh, if what I'm being told is correct, it's going to be a fun one. So I, I, I don't want to spoil anything on air in case it doesn't come to pass. But, you know, I, I'm, I'm waiting until I sign the paperwork on that one to spill the beans. <laughs> Very good. Uh, let's see. Question number five. Do you prefer new or classic cars? I'm a classic car guy uh, for the most part. I have my brother has a '67 Camaro uh, convertible, uh, so we're we're firmly in the Camaro family. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was hilarious because he recently got married, and his new wife's family is firmly in the Mustang mm -hmm. club, and so we had to make sure we had both Camaros at the wedding. <laughs> Uh, support. My dad had a Mustang in the early seventies, so uh, or an early seventies Mustang. So uh, very, very fun when I drove home in my twenty twelve Camaro. I'm like, yeah, the the this is the performance car in the family now. Right. So yep. let's see here. Um, do you wash hand wash your own vehicles? Yes. Yeah. And having three black. Personal vehicles, it's that's that's my Saturday. Yes. Uh, and I live in New Braunfels, right near a quarry. Uh, so, uh, you know, the Camaro gets to sit in the garage under a cover, and it still gets filthy. Right. Uh, and my wife isn't allowed to take her car through a drive through car wash because it's still brand new. And she's going, well, then you better get out there and wash it because it's dirty. <laughs> yeah. Uh, invest in a California car duster. Uh, it, it, it'll do wonders because, yeah, I've got a black car as well. And unfortunately, she hasn't been getting much love because I've been in so many press vehicles. It, it It's a dingy green, yellow color right now because of all the East Texas pollen. Uh, no doubt. Yeah. All right, I've got two more here. Let's see. Let's see. Would you rather build a car already, uh, build a car spec how you want it, kind of like you're doing with your Camaro, or would you rather buy it and have that factory warranty? Uh, I think that's another. It depends on what it is. Uh, you know, if it's a performance kind of car, I, I think. Like you, you alluded to earlier, man, what, what they're driving off a lot with, and uh, as Mustangs prove at every car and coffee in town, mm. uh, way too much power and way too little experience. Mm -hmm. But I think uh, buying it spec'd out would be is really cool, and then you, you kind of tweak it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and having that warranty, because, well, but the other thing is, too, is most people don't understand uh, warranty doesn't cover stupidity. <laughs> no, no, it does not. <laughs> yeah, you know, so you know, knowing what a car can do and and kind of tweaking it, I think is it, it gives you still gives you that sense of accomplishment. Mm -hmm. Kind of like I've done a little bit with mine. Uh, it's all about having the time to do that kind of stuff uh, when you work and families and stuff like mm -hmm. that. You don't get to have near the fun you want to, but. You know, as time has progressed, I'm getting, I'm getting more and more time to do the things I like to do uh, with that. So, yeah, I think specking it out as much as you can because, you know, I mean, God, even the ZL1, you, you get it all perform and performed out. You know, that's a $60,000, $70,000 car. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's still more stuff you can do to it. Yep, yep. But it's a sixty or $70,000 car that set 
record times uh, for its class on the Nürburgring. So, like, yeah. it, it, it's an impressive vehicle all around. And this well, is like the, the, the Camaro, I, the, the guy who works on my cars, I was this close to pulling the trigger on a Grand Sport Corvette. Okay. Because uh, the year I decided to move up, I had to put it in the roll bar. I was putting the GPS system in the car and all this stuff. I told my wife, I'm going to drop five, six grand into the car. I can put that money in a brand new Corvette because mm-hmm. it was a closeout. They were pre- prepping for the closeout mm-hmm. of the C7. And I had had a great car, but my mechanic goes, look, dude, we can rebuild that Camaro 10 times as what it's cost you to rebuild that Corvette once. Right. right. So, uh, you yeah, knowing what you have, yep. uh, is, you know, and my car will do any, there's at the race, there's a ton of Corvettes. It's a, it, Corvette is the most popular car out there. I, I my imagine. car will do what anything, any of those Corvettes will do. Yeah. Well, shoot. One of the reasons why we're recording when we're recording is I was invited out. The uh, 2023 Corvette Z06 is making its press tour from dealership to dealership around the country and was here in Tyler, Texas. And they did an unveil and invited me out to get some pictures and some video for a a video I'm going to drop later today. And uh, yeah, what that car is capable of just rolling off the factory is incredible. But at the same time, like you're going to pay heftily, heft, yeah. heft, heftily, <laughs> mightily for it. And yeah, uh, yeah they'll, they'll get their worth out of it. Yeah. They had that tour come through here. I think it was the Thursday before, or the Wednesday before I left for the race. Yeah. Uh, and I didn't get to go see it, but I've seen a lot of the stuff online for it. And you don't mind waiting and you got a hole burning in your checkbook by all means. <laughs> go for it. Do it. All right. Final question of the random misfire. End on a perhaps easy one. Favorite car based movie? Cannonball Run. All right. Uh, very good one to end this interview on. You are not the first to say it, nor do I think you will be the last. Um, it, it's, first, day of re- first day of retirement, I'm doing the cannonball run. Did you see the news stories of the people taking advantage of the shutdowns during 2020? Yeah. Trying to yeah. set records? I'm, I'm a big, big follower of Vin Wiki and Ed Boland. Yeah. Uh, he's the guy, the, the now the godfather of the cannonball run news and records and stuff like that but uh yeah it's crazy i just yeah you know, i think it's sub 27 hours now yep. well, which uh, and, yeah that's just ridiculous <laughs> i have no i have no thoughts that i'm going to do a competitive run but i just want to make the trip right and say that i've done it you go coast to coast one shot Maybe a day or two, <laughs> but it's, just to say you did it. It's uh, kind of like Route 66, you know, just to be part of something, an iconic it, route. Yeah. Exactly, exactly, and, and, and stuff like that. But, uh, yeah, that would be fun. But, uh, you know, just let your let your listeners know that, number one, uh, there are spots open for the October race. Still, uh, when I talked to Crystal earlier today, she said, eh, just make sure you mention that. Right. There are spots to open if people want to come out. Uh, the website is a great source with a ton of information of everything you could ever want to know about the race. And um, that's B-B-O-R-R. Yeah, B-B-O-R-R.com will get you all that information. I'll put the link down in the show notes below. Absolutely. So will you be there in October? Well, my wife doesn't want me to go again. <laughs> she said, you've done it five years, five times in a row. Yeah. Uh, I, I told myself that I might vo- just go and volunteer to be a gate guard, mm-hmm. uh, give a little bit back. Yeah. Uh, Cause they, they have a hard time getting volunteers, even though the community support the event wholeheartedly. I think for the, all the fun that I have, it would be go, it would be good to go and volunteer and just, uh, be a worker. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, I've got to do it once this year, help them put on the race. Uh, so I'll be there in one form or another. Well, 
Joe, well, Joe, I, <laughs> I heard that. <laughs> Joe, I, I appreciate you coming on, shooting the breeze, uh, making me question my October plans <laughs> just a little bit further. And I'm, I'm scheming over here, Joe. I'm scheming. Uh, well, if you need some help with Holly, we can make it work related. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, I, I don't think the Chevy Cruze would do it, though, but uh, I've got some dealer connections here in town with some really awesome rigs that would prove to be very fun on that road course. One, The first year I did it, I was in the 85 mile on class, as I said. There was a guy who had an unlimited car, but in the five, six years I've been going to the race, I've never seen this car finish. Mm. Well, this year, the first year I did it, his car broke down even before he started. Mm. So he put his toter home in the 85 mile an hour class <laughs> and he beat me. Oh, <laughs> I, I wouldn't say that on air, Joe. Come on. Well, it's, it's not all about the speed. It's the right. time and the distance, right. uh, you know, difference between first and third was point zero one seven one eight one nine right you know uh so it's a time over distance thing if it was yeah if it was wheel to wheel racing i own the toter home but he knew what he was doing math wise mm -hmm. uh with the speed and stuff like that and so uh you see everything and the guy with the big four-door dually truck that runs i think and i think he runs in the hundred mile an hour class that is just hilarious to watch but mm -hmm. he's pretty good at it too yeah Ah, gotta love Texas. Well, Joe, thank you so much for joining us, for telling us about your experience at the Big Bend Open Road Race. As he said, October still has some opening, so bborr dot com for that. Uh, Joe, been a blast talking to you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Corey. I appreciate it. Well, there you have it, gearheads. You can see now why I want to upgrade my Chevy Cruze because I desperately want to take part in maybe the October 5th rally. Sorry, October 15th rally, which, you know, just so happens to be right around my birthday. It would be an awesome event and, you know, great present to myself. But that's beside the point. I, 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 Oh, I want to take part so badly. I want a fun vehicle to do this. And I have sampled so many fun vehicles lately that uh, you, you just need to head on over to my YouTube channel to find out what all I have been driving. Definitely some cars I would like to have on this open road rally uh, through West Texas. It sounds like so much fun. I thank Joe for coming on this week and thank you for listening each week to conversations from people throughout the automotive industry. If you want to know more about us, head on over to gtgaragetalk.com and find links to all that we do. Until next time, bye.